and we are going to go from the sea. We, we started the forest with Andy uh, an hour ago. We went to the sea. We're going back to the forest for a little bit. I know we've got lots more ocean programs to come for our uh, marine inclined audience today, but I want to take you on a journey to Costa Rica with the Toucan Rescue Ranch's vet supervisor, Andre, who's going to tell us about the mysterious world of sloths. Now, the Toucan Rescue Ranch was one of our very first organizations uh, we reached out to in the very first Global Biodiversity Festival back in 2020. And so I'm so excited to dive in with them on this wild and incredible world. So Andre, thank you so much for being here with us today, man. Hey, how's it going? Oh, I mean, you are yeah. hanging out in the background. You got to see Dr. Graham and she just blew our mind with all the cool stuff she's doing. And I, it's been such a journey today. I think we've been to 15 countries already or something, and we're just getting started in day two. So welcome in. <laughs> all right. So, uh, well, welcome to Costa Rica, first of all, right? Um, you know, quick uh, flight right over here. But today I've got to the pleasure, the utmost pleasure of showing you uh, all about um, the animal that I'm most passionate about. And something I like to say is that a lot of people know um, sloths, but not a lot of people know about sloths. And so these animals, you know, they're severely understudied. And so it's really, really cool that I get to have the opportunity to share a little bit about the wonderful and mysterious world of sloths uh, with you today. So today I want to talk to you a little bit about what makes a sloth a sloth and how that may be very different from uh, what a lot of people think. Um, what sloths may be related to, which is a bit of a, um, an interesting thing. Uh, the long, long dynasty of sloths is a bit of a Game of Thrones with them. And then uh, what makes them special and how we humans are affecting them and what we can do to help them out. But first of all, um, I am the vet supervisor at this wonderful organization called Toucan Rescue Ranch. Our mission is to rescue, rehabilitate, and release. That's kind of like our, uh, our motto or our way of life. And the idea is that uh, every single animal that we would receive here in Costa Rica uh, from, for any reason whatsoever, we would like to take out into the wild and give them the opportunity to be free again and go back into the trees. And so um, one of the animals that we have focused a lot of our efforts into are of course sloths and the thing with sloths is that in Costa Rican culture sloths are not something that we talk about a lot. Uh, certainly that has changed in the last couple of years but um, when I was growing up here in Costa Rica people barely knew what a sloth was and also people kind of like were not super aware that they were kind of important animals. They um, thought of them as sluggish and slow and kind of boring, stinky and ugly. And while, you know, I'm still not convinced on their beauty, uh, even throughout all these years, they are fantastic animals. And it's a pity that we haven't been able to recognize that. And so my hopes is that by learning a little bit about what is a sloth, we can, um, you know, kind of like turn that um, around on its head and, um, you know, move forward uh, with the really, really cool idea about what these animals actually are. So um, basically, um, this is kind of like the, the Wikipedia definition of what a sloth is. And so uh, they say that sloths are a group of arboreal neotropical so northern mammals constituting the suborder polybora, noted for the slowness of movement. They spend most of their lives hanging upside down in the trees of the tropical rainforests of South America and Central America. And that definition is wrong. It's very, very, very wrong. The thing about this definition is that it doesn't take into consideration a lot of things about what makes a sloth a sloth. Um, and also the wide diversity of sloths that we have even now in the world, but way, way before that as well. Now, I've worked with seven years, um, with over for over seven years now with sloths, be it the extant ones that we have here in the rainforest of Costa Rica, or the ones uh, that we can have in museums, giant ground sloths and marine sloths and sloths in all shapes and sizes. So what is a sloth? What brings all of those animals together under the same umbrella? Well, these are a group of herbivorous, yes, certainly, sonarthran mammals that constitute the suborder folivora and are known for their slow metabolism. If you noticed, I've eliminated all reference to them hanging because that's something that only extant sloths really do. They're known for their slow metabolism, but they can be surprisingly fast if they really, really want to. And these are a group of American mammals, certainly, 
but they could be found all over the Americas. Um, the furthest north we found the sloth is in the furthest north north parts of California. And so certainly you could have found a sloth in North America, Central America, and even South America in the past. But nowadays we can only find them, find them in Central America and South America. So something that a lot of people don't realize is that sloths are some of the most diverse groups of mammals to have ever existed. Uh, when we're talking about their like group, Sonarthra, um, this group evolved even while they were still dinosaurs around. And so while sloths are more newcomers to this uh, wonderful evolutionary race, they only evolved about 30 million years ago. Um, they are extraordinarily diverse. And in South America, because they originally evolved in South America, they um, became one of the most successful animals out there, able to have um, incredible, incredible diversity and fulfill all sorts of niches. Over in this picture over here, we have some of the most interesting sloths out there. And honestly, just a little bit um, of, of, of like a brush stroke of what the reality of sloths can be. Um, but you have some excellent species, certainly, some of the giant ground sloths as well, some of the cave dwelling sloths, like um, this guy over here, and then, of course, some marine sloths as well, like the uh, 13 species of Thalassocomus. Now, in modern Costa Rica, though, we only have two species of sloths, which are the Hoffman's two toed sloth and the um, brown-throated three-toed sloth. And uh, over here at the Toucan Rescue Ranch, we have decided to kind of like uh, spice it up and call them more two-fingered and three-fingered sloths. So you might um, hear me referring to that. But these guys over here, they're very, very interesting because while they evolved to fulfill very similar ecological niches, they evolved from very, very different family trees of the very different parts of the family tree um, within sloths. And so they are actually not closely related at all. They have a different number of chromosomes. They cannot mate with each other. And when you actually uh, look at them really closely, or not closely at all, actually, you would be able to tell that they're extraordinarily different from one another. Now, when sloths, um, basically when sloths appeared on the uh, on the radar uh, in the late 1800s, um, they were classified with other animals um, in this big group called Edentata. And I call that the lost taxa because this is kind of like a reference about how we humans used to classify animals in the past. Um, before the advent of DNA technology and genomes and things like that, we used to classify animals due to their morphology, due to the way they look. And the thing that all of these animals have in common is that they have either no teeth or teeth without any real uh, enema, which is the protective layer over the teeth. And so all of these animals used to be grouped together, um, but now they're not. Now we know better. How do we know better? Because of DNA studies. Uh, the advent of uh, genome technology in the uh, late 1900s allowed us to realize and to recontextualize all the um, different relationships that these animals have with one another. And so now we know that uh, aardvarks and pangolins are not part of the sloth family tree, while armadillos and anteaters are. And here's what I'm talking about. One of the most interesting things that you can see truly is that you can really, really be, you're really, really easily able to tell that all of these animals are related to one another when you look at their embryos. And so here we have the embryo of a two-finger sloth, a three-finger sloth, a tamandua, um, sorry, a giant anteater, a tamandua, and um, an armadillo. And you can really, really tell how similar they are in their morphologies to one another. Now, tamanduas and sloths are actually a lot more closely related to one another, so anteaters and sloths, that is, than they are to armadillos. But all of them, all of these guys over here, uh, make up huge family called the northern family um, and uh, this family includes you know every species of armadillo out there 
also every species of anteater, the giant anteaters, the tamanduas, and also the pygmy anteaters, which are really, really cute, and all six extant species of sloths as well. Now, the family tree of sloths is an even more complicated deal because we know that they uh, are closely related to tamanduas, to anteaters, um, but how they are grouped together is a bit of a mess. And it isn't until the 2010s and the kind of like sloth revolution or um, sloth renaissance, as I like to call it, uh, that we actually started doing a lot of research and a lot of um, work with sloths that we realized and tried, started to clarify a little bit about those relations. And so interestingly enough, we've realized that sloths kind of divide themselves in three different groups. So the Antillean sloths, which are these sloths that first escaped from South, South America and swam into the Isles of the Caribbean and evolved separately. These are incredible, incredible animals who look unlike any sloth who I've ever, ever had the pleasure of working with, uh, be it extinct or extant. And um, then we have our uh, megatherid sloths and then also um, our myodontid sloths. And um, these are animals that are relatively closely related to one another that have formed, you know, giants in uh, both branches. But those are the branches that have given us as well the modern sauce that we have nowadays, the two-fingered sauce and the three-fingered sauce. And uh, you can see that the last common ancestor, the two-fingered sauce and three-fingered sauce had with each other was, you know, almost 10 to even 15 million years ago. So it's it's kind of crazy that people still think that they are related. So having said all of that, then what are some of the common characteristics of sloths? What, what are the things that I would say, oh yeah, well, all sloths, living or dead, share this? Well, that's quite interesting. One of the mo most interesting things about sloths is their temperature. They are what we consider to be poikilotherms, which means that these are animals that um, can't quite regulate their own body temperature uh, by metabolic processes like we can, um, but they produce some amount of heat from that and also use the heat of the environment to be able to regulate their body temperature. This is a fantastic adaptation um, because it allows them to um, essentially be very, very reliant on the rest of their environment to be able to function. But it also um, makes it so that sloths are only tropical animals. Now, some of the giants before that used to be able to live in ice age conditions because of a term called gigantothermy. But now the sloths that we have currently nowadays are a bit more on the you know kind of slow and steady side. Um, vascular bundles. Something interesting about sloths is that their veins and arteries are really, really different from what you would find in other animals. They are really, really well adapted to be able to hang or to be able to dig uh, which is the two main things that every sloth out there has done through its life. Um, also, abnormal, abnormal cervical anatomy is quite interesting because sloths tend to have a defective Cox gene, which makes it so that they have um, more or less vertebrae than any other mammal out there, uh, which is super, super cool. And this is uh, on an individual basis, so not necessarily like a group, but um, some sloths may have less vertebrae even if they are siblings um, than the others. And then of course their hair, which is very, very well known because of its ability to hold algae in it, that um, essence gives them this green, green tint and coloration. Something really, really interesting as well is that all modern sloths are arboreal, so they all live in trees. They're all folivorous, which means that they all eat leaves. They have multiple stomachs, and here I have a couple references to that. You can see that the um, four chambered stomach of a cow right there and the one chambered stomach of a human and the six chambered stomach of a sloth. And it's really, really interesting um, because while not as differentiated as you would find in, uh, in a cow, it's something that's really, really cool because it allows them to eat leaves all day long and metabolize them in proper ways. And the other thing that sloths, modern sloths have now is that they hang. 
Uh, they don't hang upside down. They can certainly, but that's not something that they do um, like super often, uh, especially if they don't rest upside down. Um, but uh, they hang, they're suspensorial, which is a method of locomotion that most mammals don't have. And so they're very, very cool that way. So what are some of the challenges that these animals are facing? The most important challenge that these animals are facing, especially from us, is um, basically deforestation. Um, over here in Costa Rica and basically all throughout their range, we have, we humans want to move into places that were classically rainforest. And by doing so, we have eliminated the past where these animals live. Um, a phenomenon that we have started to see in you know, the last 20 to 25 years with sloths is the advent of urban sloths, animals that have started to move and live in um, urban areas. And while that sounds kind of impressive, right, um, it also contributes to the next problem, which is actually genetic isolation. Now, sloths, uh, we think of sloths as this very slow animals that don't move much and don't do a lot. But in reality, sloths are actually quite mobile. And they are, especially males, patrol and move around a lot. And they go out and they fight for females and they you know, try to move further into the rainforest. And so they require long expanses of territory uh, for their lives to be able to you know, exist. And so um, by living in heavily deforested areas, these sloths have no chance of moving to other places. And that generates a genetic stagnation, which causes uh, problems in the long term because we're having you know, cousins made with cousins. And uh, that's not one of the greatest things for the genetic variability of this species. Then we have electrocution. With deforestation and the building of streets and building of human complexes, we have the add of, of course, uh, electricity. Uh, nowadays, we humans can't seem to live without it. Uh, well, I am presenting from my computer after all. Uh, but um, electrocution in mismanaged power lines or by being the only way that animals can use, the only way or road that animals can use to cross from one side of the rainforest to the other causes a lot of um, a lot of problems, especially a lot of accidents uh, that may leave the animal damaged or dead. Contact with other animals is also something that sloths are starting to see. Well, in the wild, an animal like a two-finger sloth wouldn't really have um, a lot of things that would try to hunt it. Occasionally, a very reckless wild cat would try to give it their all. Um, but in reality, sloths, especially adult sloths, tend to be immune to predation. And so um, it's really, really interesting that um, you know, most animals will try to avoid them unless absolutely pressed for food or desperate for it, but uh, dogs won't. And so by having urban sloths that go down and, you know, defecate on the ground, uh, dogs can come in contact with them really easily and try to attack them. And that's terrible for both of them, because while a dog can kill a sloth, a sloth can also certainly kill a dog. And uh, that's not, you know, a great interaction overall. And car accidents are also a big thing. While sloths are maybe not super prone to getting into car accidents, they're very good at driving, uh, no joking, but um, they um, are not very prone to go to the ground to begin with. And so they, were, they would be a lot more likely to just use power lines to cross and get electrocuted. Um, but certainly it does happen especially in the areas where there is no power lines and the only way that a sloth can cross from point A to point B is just by walking on the ground. And it's a sad reality, but here in the tropics, car accidents are a silent killer of a lot, a lot of wildlife. So what do we need to do to help? Over here at Tucan Rescue Ranch, we have uh, essentially what we call our Saving the Sloths Together program, which is a fantastic program where we receive tons of different animals um, but especially sloths. And uh, we race them up together and then we release them back into the wild. Uh, we receive uh, sloths of every age, be it adults that have come here because of electrocution or dog attacks or predation attempts, anything like that. And we would like to race them up and then release them into the wild or babies as well. And what's really, really interesting is that sloths are extraordinarily resilient as a species. They are really, really, really amazing animals, really, really strong. 
uh, pictured over here. This is actually a recent picture, and she is absolutely stunning as Socorro. Socorro was um, actually a um, juvenile assault that we received a couple years ago. She had been electrocuted and actually ended up losing her arm. We had to amputate it because of the extension of the injury. Uh, but she went back into the wild, and you can see her radio color right there. So we've been tracking her down over the years. And uh, what's really, really cool is that Socorro has basically gone back into the wild full-fledged and um, has made it a couple times for just a couple of babies, and this is her most recent baby. Um, so that's always something that I'm very, very happy to see because that means that our, our work, you know, pays off and the, the animals are being properly reintegrated into the wild. So what can we do to help? Um, it's always important that, you know, like the general person can help out in these ways. Um, it's great that we can say as an organization that we help out sloth and that we do all this, all these things. But how can somebody from, you know, uh, that doesn't even live close to sloths help out with them? So the, one of the main things is, of course, to help out and donate to conservation projects that help save sloths. Um, you can also um, inform yourself, which is really, really cool, because um, while it could happen with sloth, certainly, um, and um, it also happens a lot with other species of, of animals that people, you know, find an orphan and they freak out and they bring it to um, a rescue and rehabilitation facility when it, all it needed was to be put back where it was. So informing yourself in that way is a good way of helping wildlife in general. Um, also aiding in, in projects that help install wildlife bridges. Um, we have a lot of projects like that here in Costa Rica that um, basically uh, have allowed for wildlife to cross using safe paths, uh, which is really cool. Um, create urban spaces for sloths to be able to live in peacefully without being in contact with dogs and other threats. Creating wildlife roads that allow for the um, passage uh, or the undisturbed, preserved um, um, nature uh, so that, that, you know, the nature itself or the forest isn't being fragmented as much. And of course, one thing that we do here, which is always rescue, rehabilitate, and rewild. And yeah, so over here about Tugan Rescue Ranch, yeah, we work with um, wildlife and uh, it's really, really cool. And you can find us over at our web page over here. And yeah. Jose, well, honestly, every time I get a chance to hang with you guys at the Two Game Rest Ranch, it always makes me so, so happy. I can't believe you started the program by saying you have trouble seeing the beauty in them. Like a whole generation is yelling at you. Um, you're in this amazing role with the sloths, but I guess you get to see them in a way that other people don't. So we'll give you the, the benefit of the doubt on that one. Um, yeah. Honestly, uh, what, a, what a fun tour. I, you highlighted so well the ways that people can help protect sloths. Again, wherever they're joining from, you guys have one of the most incredible education campaigns of any organization we partner with for the Global BioFest. So people have that chance to go to the site, your social media, take part in these incredible activities to help protect the sloths and make sure that some of those threats are, are mitigated. So I'm glad we highlighted some of those. I guess as you've been doing this over the last uh, you know many years, is there something that really uh, strikes you about sloths that the average person in the, the public wouldn't know or, or would, would be uh, especially excited to hear? Anything that really jumps out? I know you shared so much, but. Well, my, my favorite fact about sloths is how aggressive they are. <laughs> and I know that sounds kind of weird, but it's it's really cool because like people don't think about it in that way. But I, I'm covered in scars of, with for sloths about sloths, um, and they bite and they claw and they are really scary. Um, I feel like I'm the only person in the world that has nightmares with sloths sometimes. But honestly, they um, you know when you have one and it's really really aggressive and you're trying to help it out, but it's just being like <laughs> there's like there's something scary about that. That's and so um, there's, there's something impressive about that as well. Um, yeah. You know, and it, it brings you, it brings you full circle because um, you really, people really tend to think about these animals as more like, as more like cuddly teddy bears, um, but they are animals. And of course, since they're animals, they have aggressive impulses and they have, you know, their cute and cuddly side, but they also have, you know, like this way of defending themselves because if, if not, they just wouldn't exist anymore. Um, so, you know, highlighting that, I think it's like uh, the coolest thing that I can because it really shows to people that, no, these are not puppets. These are animals. 
Yeah. I, I love what you said earlier. Yeah. 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 That was awesome. That is not <laughs> our, our unexpected phrase of the day. And I know your colleague Andrea is joining us tomorrow to take us on a little tour, see some sloths up close and personal. So we'll cover that again. But uh, I think it's really important to emphasize that you shouldn't be holding sloths. You shouldn't go and try and grab them. If you see people with sloths uh, as like a, a tourism operation, you should not retweet those pictures and share that. I think that goes a really long way to helping protect these species. So. Andre, thank you so much for sharing your expertise and passion with us today. We appreciate it more than you know. And uh, again, for anyone keen to tune in, toucanrescueranch.org is your place to go to learn more about Andre's work and uh, the whole work of the amazing team there. So have a wonderful day. Keep Have fun with the sloths. Don't get any more scars, okay? I'll try not to. Okay. <laughs>